Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and I'm going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, I'm going to tell you the story of Cygnus the Swan, the name of a constellation gifted to us by the Greeks. But first, let's take a few deep, relaxing breaths while imagining those beautiful stars. Inhale, picturing the dark night sky, taking a few seconds pause to behold, in your mind, wherever you are, the beautiful panorama of stars. Exhale, as you remember how each of them twinkles in their own way. It's as if they're traveling on different journeys, yet together they create a mesmerizing sight to marvel. You may wonder, as you lie there, breathing in, breathing out, looking up into the vast sky, how all of those constellations were formed. They do appear quite close together, but, in fact, stars within each constellation are, in reality, inconceivably far away from each other. If we continue to look up, inhaling and exhaling, we notice what astronomers call the virtual belt. The virtual belt is where our eyes see the planets of our solar system, plus the sun, moon, and stars moving about. Since the beginning of time, mankind has been trying to look to the stars and make sense of it all. It was the Babylonians who first classified groups of stars into catalogues sometime before 1000 BC. In Southeast Asia, the Chinese empires had their own ancient philosophies and men who read the stars and planets. Yet, no matter what great discoveries science makes about our unfathomable universe, one thing has remained with us through the ages. The names for the zodiac signs and the names of the constellations or groups of stars that look as if they form a distinct pattern or picture. You may be familiar with the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion the Great Hunter, or Taurus the Bull. Recognizing these patterns helps us orient when looking up to the night sky. The ancient Greeks and Romans are responsible for naming many constellations, whose names are still in use today. But I promised you a bedtime story, and that is why we are going to talk about the constellations. Once upon a time, there lived a youth named Phaethon. His name means radiant or shining. He was born to a mortal woman named Clemene. As a young boy, Phaethon never knew who his real father was. His mother chose not to tackle this topic until the time was right for Phaethon to know. Phaethon had a best friend whose name was Cygnus. Both boys were as close as brothers. They laughed and played and tumbled together. They learned to fish and hunt together, went to school together, and told each other their deepest secrets. If one boy was in a bad mood, the other would also be found sulking. If one was happy and radiant, the other found a reason to be cheerful as well. One day, 
down by the river Eridanus. The two boys were talking. Well, I wish I could meet my father, said Phaethon. I wish I could know who he was. Why don't you tell your mother that it's time she told you? replied Cygnus. Well, after all, we aren't children anymore. Your mother should honour your wishes to know, if she truly loves you, and I believe she does. Because of his friend's encouragement, Phaeton finally mustered up the courage to ask his mother. One night, during supper, when the candlelight was the only glow in the room, he posed the question. Mother, said Phaeton, I know you've told me before not to prod you for the truth, but I must know, tonight. Please, I beg you to tell me who my real father is, and where I can find him. Glamini looked at her son with kindness, his dark hair glowing in the candlelight. She took his two hands in hers and kissed them. I shall tell you, my son, but you must promise me one thing. Well, of course, mother, Phaeton replied. You must promise me that once I tell you the secret, you will not go looking for your father. It can only lead to misery. Phaeton wondered at these strange words, but he was eager to know the secret. And so he said, Of course, mother, I promise. And there is a second thing, his mother said. Do not tell anyone else either. The second promise, Phaeton thought, would be harder to keep. Do you swear? pressed his mother. Of course, replied Phaeton. He could not wait to hear the secret. Your father is a titan, a powerful god, and his work keeps him away from us. Although, all this time, he has been looking down on you with love, shining his light upon your face every single day, said Clemini. The boy nodded, still waiting to know his father's name. I have not told you all this time because I did not want you to be sad that your father cannot be with us. His work in the heavens keeps him away. He is the one who brings the light to us mortals. Every day, he drives a chariot of fire across the sky on two wheels pulled by flying horses that is seen by all men, women, children, and gods. It is his duty to bring light, for that light brings energy, and that energy is the source of all life that we know. Phaeton's eyes grew wide. Is my father... Yes, Phaeton, said his mother softly, though the words felt as powerful and searing as the fire on a cold, dark night. Your father is the sun god, Helios. Phaeton could not hide his joy at finally knowing. He smiled, though happy tears clouded his eyes and ran down his cheeks. His mother hugged him tightly, and tucked him in bed. As she pulled the covers over her son, she reminded him once more, Remember to keep the secrets I have told you, just as I have kept them all these years. Yes, mother, said Phaeton, and closed his eyes. Now, as you can imagine, Phaeton had no intention of actually not telling anyone who his father was, Certainly it would be okay if he told his friend, Cygnus. After all, he was the one who had persuaded Phaeton to ask his mother, and he would surely want to know the answer as well. The very next day after school, he met Cygnus by the river Eridanus. There, the swans had also gathered, and were sailing past the boys gracefully. The boys watched the swans glide, and threw some bread in the water to feed them. 
At last, when he was certain that nobody could hear, Phaeton told his friend, Mother told me who my father is. She did. His friend replied, Finally, who is your father? You are not going to believe it, said Phaeton. Or perhaps, said Cygnus. Try me. I, dear Cygnus, am half deity. My father is the one whom all men have known since the day of their birth. He is the one responsible for bringing us light, energy and life. Cygnus looked at his friend as if he did not believe that he was half god. My father, continued Phaeton, is the sun god, Helios. Upon hearing this, Cygnus did not immediately laugh, but he did look at Phaeton with some disbelief. He could not imagine that Phaeton actually believed this, for did all women not wish that they were married to a god? Did all young men on earth not want to be as powerful as gods? He loved his friend and did not want to think the story to be untrue. But still, it was quite easy to fabricate and hard to believe. And so he simply said, Phaeton, are you quite sure? This was not the answer Phaeton was expecting. He couldn't believe his ears. He thought for sure, of all the boys in school, it would be his best friend who would believe him. Ah, perhaps this was why his mother was so keen on him keeping it a secret. Perhaps she knew that no one, not even his closest friend, would believe him. But of course I am sure, because mother told me so, answered Phaeton. Then his happiness turned to irksomeness. You are just jealous, Cygnus, he snapped, because you are a mere mortal and I am not. I'm not jealous, replied Cygnus, but you must be sure of this before you believe it in full. Of course I would be more than happy for you, dear friend, if your father is indeed who you say he is. What could be better news than that? But, as a friend, I must implore you. Find out for yourself if what your mother has told you is true or not. And how do you expect me to do that? said Phaeton. Go to the place of Helios. Ask him if he is truly your father. He will not be able to deny it. Phaeton listened to his friend's words realizing that perhaps what he was saying was true. He should know for certain, for himself. He should ask Helios to prove his paternity, and if proven, he should be given a place in the palace as the son of a god. And so, that night, Phaeton set out quietly to do just as Cygnus had suggested. Without telling his mother, he set off for the palace of Helios. He had read that it was located somewhere in the east, and that by following the point where the sun rose every morning, he could locate it. When Phaeton arrived to the far east, he could not believe the magnificence that surrounded him. Diamonds, rubies, and precious stones lined the roads. It was as if the trees bore fruits of crystals, and everywhere the scent of sweet perfume filled the air. By the time he arrived at Helios' palace, he knew that he was in the right place. For the golden light, tinged with red just hovering over the horizon, placed him in the perfect position of sunrise. As he got closer to the palace, the light grew brighter and brighter. It shone as if it might blind him. Still, Phaeton moved forward bravely. Massive ivory columns held up the entrance to the palace. Phaeton continued walking, in awe, mesmerized. He walked until he reached a diamond-studded throne, with piles of roses strewn around it. 
dancing maidens surrounded the throne, and birds fluttered happily above it. And there, sitting on the wonderful throne, was a handsome and powerful, strong and brilliant god. There, in all his glory, sat Helios. Boldly, Phaeton approached the throne. Staying respectful, he bowed low, kissing the ground. He waited until Helios acknowledged him, and until one of the beautiful maidens took his hand and led him up the mighty steps. Who are you, and what do you want? asked Helios, his voice filling the air with warmth. I am Phaeton, son of Clemene. I have been living below amongst men, raised by my mother for all these years. I approach you, O Helios, to see if you do not recognize me. And if you do, declare to everyone here, and to my mother, and to the whole world the truth. There was a murmur in the palace as attendants, servants, and other deities whispered between themselves. For no one had seen this young stranger before. What was he talking about? Look at me, said Phaeton, pleading with Helios. I beseech you, look into my eyes. What do you see? At these last words, the god Helios moved forward in his throne a little. Then a glint of recognition came over him. He rose to his feet, walked down the steps, and came closer to the young man until the heat of his form was overpowering Phaeton. Could it be? he cried. Son of Clemene, you say? The young man nodded before the sun god respectfully, then opened his eyes wide again to see if this god would truly recognize him. I have been suffering for so long, not knowing the truth, said Phaeton. So I am here in your presence today to find out for myself. Answer me this. Are you my father? Suddenly, Helios fell to his own knees and hugged the lad. The god embraced him so tightly that it surprised Phaeton. He wrapped his arms around Helios in return and whispered, so, is it true? After a few moments, Helios regained his composure and answered him. Yes, you are my son. My son, you were the light of my being since the moment you were born. But I could not come to you, for it was your mother's wish. She asked me to protect you, to watch over you with my light, but not make myself known to you. Phaeton could feel rage building up inside of him. But why? he pleaded. Why would my mother let me suffer like this? She knew of my duties to humankind, to the earth, said Helios in reply. She knew that I could not abandon them to be with you all the days of your life. She did not want to cause you pain. And so she decided it was better that you not know at all. And you granted her wish, said Phaeton. I did, replied Helios. Yet now I see what a fine young man you have grown to be. And I cannot say I do not regret my decision. How can I make it up to you? How shall we spend the time that we have lost together? What do you wish for, my son? Oh, father! cried Phaeton. I wish that the whole world could know the truth. I wish that the boys in school could see me for who I really am and not call me the illegitimate one. He paused, as if collecting his words, before continuing. But, most of all, I wish that my dear, dear friend Cygnus could know it first, for it was he who implored me to come and see you, it was his words that gave me the courage to seek you out and to find you. And 
in doing so, to find out the truth. Then we shall tell him, smiled the sun god. He took his son's hand in his powerful hand and led him up the great stairs. But first you must eat, for I am sure you are tired and hungry after your long journey. I shall call the maidens to bring you venison and wine. Thank you, my father Helios, but there is no time to lose. I want to tell Cygnus at once, and I want him to come and meet you. Well, if you think that is better, began Helios. I have just the idea, said Phaeton. If you would allow me, father, to borrow your chariot of fire, I shall race with it up to the other side of the world where my friend Cygnus is just waking up. When he rises up from his sleep, he will not know if it is a dream or if it is real. But soon he will know that everything I have said is true. I shall pick him up in the fire chariot, race him back here, and we shall all celebrate. I see he is like a brother to you, said Helios. More than a brother, replied Phaeton. Very well, my son, said his father. I will grant your wish, but just this once. Go, take my chariot, find your friend, and bring him back to the palace, so we can have a proper celebration and reunion, but I must tell you, do not drive the chariot too high or too low. Stay in the middle course so you do not lose control. Phaeton was overjoyed. What a surprise his friend Cygnus would wake up to. He jumped into the brilliant fire chariot. It was ablaze with light and hot flames, but he didn't feel the fire, for his demigod body was starting to serve him well. As Helios watched him drive the chariot away, a sudden wave of remorse ran over him. For not even the great god Zeus himself would have asked for such a favor. In fact, no god has ever made such a request. To drive his sun chariot across the heavens. And yet, he could not say no to his son. His son, whom he has missed for so many years. He wanted to grant his wish. To show him his love. To give him all that he desired. Back on earth. Clemini was tending her garden in the early morning. She assumed that Phaeton had gone off to school, or at least she hoped he hadn't wandered somewhere else along the way. As she watered her flowers, a blazing trail of light flashed across the sky. She stood up and shaded her eyes with one hand as she observed the strange light moving. No racing across the sky. Was it a star? But it was too bright and visible in the daylight. Was it a god? Surely no one but Helios would be racing across the sky at this time of day. At that instant, her heart sank. She suddenly knew who it was, racing across the vast morning sky. No. Fed no, she cried, clutching her heart, the tears welling up in her eyes. Phaeton could not believe his good fortune. What magnificent fiery horses! His friend Cygnus would be amazed. All the boys at school would be in shock. But his mother, oh dear sweet mother, how would she react? He hoped that she would be happy for him, and happy to know that Helios had recognized and accepted him as his son. As these thoughts were racing in his head, the chariot wheels were spinning faster and faster. The white horses galloped through the sky, and Phaeton cracked his whip to make them run faster, ablaze. He couldn't wait to reach his friend. He didn't notice that he was slipping lower on course. The horses were going so fast, and he assumed that he'd be able to steer them easily. 
But these were no ordinary horses, no ordinary chariot, and no small feet. Within minutes, the poor Phaeton lost control, and the chariot was careening even more. The horses, sensing that their driver was inexperienced, paid no heed to his desperate calls to slow down. Phaeton tried with all the words he had in his vocabulary to tell them to get back on course. But it was to no avail. The fiery chariot spun out of control, hitting a group of stars and sending them whirling into spirals. Phaeton realized that the chariot would not slow down. But it was too late now. The chariot started causing more and more destruction with every second. It whipped up a whirlwind and caused weather disruptions over many lands. The heat wave, which sank a little lower than normal, caused droughts on the African continent. And in areas which were normally warm, the weather turned icy. Hail and snowstorms, floods and tornadoes. Zeus, who had been watching this whole time, could stand it no longer. Angered, that Helios could give in to such stupidity and rashness, he decided to take matters into his own powerful hands. He picked up a lightning bolt and struck the chariot of fire before it could do any more damage. And with that powerful move, Phaeton fell to the earth. His body plummeted and fell into the Eridanus River, just as Cygnus was passing by. Cygnus did not know what the terrible weather, dark clouds, fire and thunderstorms meant. All he knew was that he saw the body of his best friend thrown from the sky and disappear into the dark waters below. Phaeton! he cried. But it was too late. He dove in the river at once in an attempt to save his friend. He held his breath, searching the murky darkness. But it was of no use. The body of Phaeton was nowhere to be found. Cygnus climbed back up to the riverbanks and looked around, amazed that the foul weather had suddenly passed and the sky was clearing. There was only a slight drizzle of rain, and the drops splashed on his face, melding with his own tears. He cried for his friend, not knowing what had just happened. He dove back into the river, determined to find the body. Only after hours of searching did Cygnus give up and return home. Every afternoon, he would come back to the spot on the riverbanks, where he saw his friend's body plummet. And every afternoon, he did the same thing. He would throw himself back into the murky water, plunging into the coldness, trying to navigate the depths of the darkness and find his friend. Every night, he would return home alone. After 30 days and 30 nights of this practice, the gods in the heavens, Zeus and Helios, looked down on Cygnus and started discussing what they should do. He cannot go on mourning forever, said Zeus. He only wants to collect the bones of my son's body for a proper burial, remarked Helios. But he has never known that your son was not fully mortal and that no bones would remain after him upon his demise. So he will go on searching like this and will never find peace. At least let him find Phaeton, said Helios. Zeus took pity on Cygnus and decided he would give him a chance to dive even deeper into the water to find his friend. So, he turned Cygnus into a beautiful white swan 
with powerful wings and feathers. Go, bring him home, said Zeus. The swan dove silently until he reached the bottom of the river. And there, the morning swan found the body of his friend, lying among other precious and lost things. He carried the limp body on his wings and pedaled upwards with his webbed feet. He kept on swimming, 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 until his feathers skimmed the surface of the river. But there, on the water's singing ripples, he did not stop. The swan rose higher and higher, bearing his friend beyond. The gods gave him strength to fly to the firmament and to take his friend, Phaeton, to rest with the gods above. And, taking pity on the two friends, the gods decided that Cygnus would stay in the dark night sky forever, the embodiment of a swan in the heavens. This way, he could always look upon his friend, remaining close to him, and all the people on earth below could gaze above in wonder. When humans below would look up and see the swan in the constellations, they would know the truth. That it does not matter where one comes from, or how they got there, what matters is the pace of the journey, and that it is okay to journey alone. But it is far better to journey together. To this day, all around the world, people of all nations look up to the same location in the sky, gazing towards Cygnus the Swan. Many cultures around the world have different stories for how the twinkling swan-shaped constellation got there. And many agree that that is the exact location of heaven. I hope you've enjoyed this legend of old. If one night you feel alone on your journey, may you find a little peace in your heart when you gaze up in wonder at the Swan Constellation. Good night, sweet dreams, and I'll be with you again tomorrow.